आई वी एम This is Storytellers and Story Sellers live on tape. You're listening to Vineet Kanabar on the IVM Podcast Network. Every week, we bring you some very interesting people from the world of entertainment. I have a very loose definition of entertainment. We've talked to people from web series, music, gaming, dating. Today, we're talking to people who are musicians themselves, have a legacy behind them. But they're not just resting on their legacy. They're using... all that they've been given to create a world of more musicians in a very interesting manner very very pleased to have bindu subramaniam and ambi subramaniam from sapa on this episode of storytellers and story sellers welcome to the show bindu and ambi great to have you both here thank you so much for having us um that you have a very loose definition of entertainment is possibly the funniest thing that i've heard this week <laughs> I do think I have an alternate career in stand-up comedy that I've been neglecting for the better part, and I will continue to neglect it. Uh, <laughs> I think there are much better equipped people to to do that. Before we get into this episode, let me give my listeners a whirlwind tour of Sapa. The Subramaniam Academy of Performing Arts is run by singer-songwriter Bindu Subramaniam, who's on this episode, and violinist Ambi Subramaniam. It's built on the vision of their parents, the legendary Dr. L. Subramaniam, India's violin icon, and Kavita Krishnamurthy. Subramaniam the Bollywood legend the vision for Sapa was to make quality music accessible to every learner and Sapa is a home for great music and musicians since 2007 Sapa's teaching method is dynamic research driven and designed to help students to chart a long and fulfilling music path and let me start off right there by asking you Bindu and Ambi to demystify all that and and get us started by understanding what was the vision it's been 13 14 years that you've been doing this where are we now with with sapa how how are you guys faring in your quest for making music more accessible i'm going to ask ambi to answer this cuz the complaint is always that i never let him speak but the thing before that is that even though you're saying 13 or 14 years and this is not a video recording i want everyone to know that i'm very young looking <laughs> we're That's, not we're not ages even if even if you weren't we would treat you with the same respect <laughs> but but I'm glad we have that out then i just have to say bindu even though you said that you're going to let me speak you spoke 30 seconds before that so the time was on <laughs> but yeah I, i think for us when we started sapa i think uh, the idea was uh, i think with my parents the idea was to kind of make a violin school a school where you know we have the highest quality of violin is kind of coming out and uh, we started uh, with two teachers and three students and then i think for us bindu and i kind of joined officially and and took over in 2011 and uh, there the idea i think was slowly to kind of make it a home for for music and what we also felt was we were at one stage we were kind of working with uh, the kind of quote unquote 1% of talent but then what we what we felt was that there there's so much of an a problem with access of music education not only with when we talk about music education we're not only talking about uh, cost but it's accessibility in in terms of how we presenting it to young children how are we making it fun and and uh, how do we make first generation music learners mm-hmm. kind of interested in this and uh, we, of course i mean i i'm sure a lot of people would have heard this before and we keep hearing it when parents come and say you know i am not musical or i have not learned music so i don't know how my child will be able to do that but we feel a lot of it is exposure and a lot of it is presenting it in the right way mm-hmm. so we started uh, working in schools uh, where music is a is kind of a subject like anything else so if they have a math period they have to have a physics period they also have a music period so i think a big part of our journey is to kind of make sure that we're able to reach as many kids as possible and whether people become musicians or not that's kind of not the point of what what we're doing but the idea is that everybody should have access to music and everybody should have music as an integral part of their life whatever style or genre that is for them i love it i'm always curious to ask people who say this is the right way of doing something and ambi you said you wanted to create an institution that 
at its heart had the right way of teaching music, right? Can can you help me understand that a little bit better? And here's where I'm coming from, right? To of my personal experiences with learning music, right? Although you very charitably said music is taught as any other subject, it's not. You have one music period in seven days in a standard issue CBSE school, whereas you have nine maths classes in a week, right? That's number one. Number two is even though music is so all-encompassing. It's everywhere, right? It's intuitive as well as rational. It's mathematical. Yet, it seems to be not a priority for for so many parents when it comes to the education diet of their kids, right? So, help me, in light of these things that, that we just talked about, help me understand how do you come to what is the right way of teaching music and how do you implement that at Sapa? Uh, first of all, I wouldn't say there is one kind of right way and a and everything else is wrong. Especially, I would say that because we have so many amazing teachers that kind of go through our, our training program. And I mean, we, we go through a, lo- a lot of these things. But at the end of the day, when they kind of are in front of the kids that they work with, you know, you have to continuously be on your feet and figure out, okay, fine, this maybe is not working right now with this child. So maybe let me try to kind of tweak this a little bit. So it's it's also a lot about understanding what the learning goals and outcomes are uh, in your head. So if, if you are very clear as to what you kind of want to do in class, then how you tweak that based on interest, based on how kids are responding to a particular method, you should be able to tweak that. I think that makes a, a big difference. I think the main issue when we talk about, say, music being a subject like math or like like anything else, frequency is one thing, but it's also how it's viewed mm-hmm. and how it's respected. So I, I think that is very important for us. So whether you have one kind of music period or nine music periods in, in a week, it's how it's kind of uh, viewed by teachers, how it's viewed by parents, how it's viewed by the school faculty, all of that. So that that makes a big difference. And what we have kind of seen over a period of time is it gets more and more entrenched in everything else that they're doing. So we have seen a lot of kind of uh, cases where the math teacher or say a a science teacher or an English teacher kind of comes up to our music teacher and says, you know, I used to learn music as a child. Mm -hmm. I have this time during the day. Can you kind of teach me a little bit or I would love to sing a little bit. So those kind of things are really nice. And then after a while, sometimes you see in certain cases, music gets started, uh, they, it's used in other subjects as well. So I think it's really nice to kind of see uh, this kind of journey where uh, music is not only taught for music's sake, but it's also kind of very, very nice tool to do a lot of other things. Love it. Vindu, let me bring you in here and, and you have freedom of time. <laughs> how is the pedagogy at, at Sapa different or how is it at least envisioned differently than other music teaching environments? So I think um, to add one thing to what Ambi was saying, there isn't a single right way or a single right pedagogy, but I think it is it is what inspires the students, right? So we mm-hmm. need to figure out the framework because there's never been anything wrong with the music as such, right? But when there are these perceptions around, for example, classical music or traditional music being something that's not interesting to everybody or or not cool or not accessible, it really comes down to the methodology and not the music itself. So mm-hmm. what we try to do as music educators ourselves is figure out how to create an environment where children are inspired, right? And so you do that by taking good musicians and making them effective communicators, making them passionate about getting the music across. So a lot of our pedagogy is focused around how young minds work, how mm-hmm. they learn, what is mentally stimulating for them, what is how does brain development work? And, and some of it is also like, just really basic intuitive stuff. Like if you see two teachers, right? The one who kind of walks into the classroom and makes eye contact with everybody and and engages is the one that automatically has everyone on their side. So I think a lot of it is also the communication around music and letting students know that, you know, even if music is thousands of years old and even if it's traditional and even if it goes all the way back, if it has to go forward, it has to go forward with you. 
So all music in that sense is contemporary music. All right. music in that sense is relevant music. Right. And and you should have the liberty to sort of take music and make it your own. So we we try not to take ourselves too seriously. So we really respect the music and we respect the effort that everybody's putting in. But at the end of the day, it's really about kind of doing it in a way where everyone feels joy at the end of it. Right. I feel like your pedagogy borrows, and please feel free to elaborate or correct me if I'm wrong here, but it borrows from from behavior sciences, from storytelling, right? Can you tell me a little bit more about it, maybe with a couple of examples, about how how you've been implementing these changes? And it's very interesting to know from you how you started doing this and how you sort of refined those methods as well. So take us on a journey, if you will, right? On how you've imbibed these elements of, of behavior science in music learning or in of storytelling in music learning and how you sort of over the years refined them. Bindu? There is a boring answer behind this as well. And, and the fact is that both Ambi and I have PhDs because we uh, we suffer from this degree disease and we come from a family where, you know, there's like a minimum of five or six degrees to have your seat at the dining table. So both of us have those. Uh, Congratulations. No, no, really. <laughs> no, <I'm kidding. laughs> but... <laughs> I think we reached the point where we wanted the research to back the work that we had already done, which is probably mm-hmm. not the best way to to get through it. But everything that we've done has sort of been led by experimentation. Now, for example, when when uh, I started working on the first Sapa Baby book, the idea for me was, can we create a book that makes classical music exciting for babies? It It hasn't been done before, but yet... All of us from these traditional families have been sort of put through classical music education with varying levels of success and trauma. I mean, Ambi is very much on the success end of it. I was sort of sitting on the trauma end of that spectrum. I just want uh, to come in here and say I'm part Bengali and I know what you're talking about. Yeah. But I, I like took a hard left out of that and I said, <laughs> no, I'm going to go to like independent music and I'm going to get my music education there instead of this. But I know what you mean. So, so there's a joke there about Bengali and left and all of that, but I'm not going to get into <laughs> politics. <laughs> so, so not that kind of podcast yeah. yet. Yes. <laughs> well, you never know. Well, maybe your stand-up can be political. We'll just stay off of that today. And uh I mean, there's there's a Manavar Faruqi joke which I made in the previous episode. Please go check that out. Back to you. <laughs> what an excellent plug. You know, we released a great song recently. Go check that out and be back. <laughs> <laughs> but yeah, but back to you. Coming back to it. Um, so the idea was really how do we make this experience more positive, right? Like when when we were learning music, there was a like kind of Xerox cyclo styled book that was spiral bound that would poke us and then you know the the ink would rub off on our fingers and then we'd be sitting on the floor in our music teacher's house and we'd go straight from school and and you know the mosquitoes would be biting us and we'd be fighting with each other and so this is the backdrop on which everything is set up and then how do you expect kids to be receptive right whereas if you and and that's why like western music is so cool you know you have someone who you have this really cool teacher he comes in he's playing the guitar oh my god he's probably combed his hair and then so when we started having these discussions we realized that there's so much around the music that the music itself potentially gets lost so for Mm -hmm. us the Sapa Baby book was really our first starting point of trying to say how do we make classical music fascinating for babies and we spent so much time on it so many different variations of that book before we went to print I put it in the hands of literally every child I could see. I was that creepy lady who's like, here's a book, would you like to see it? And then we were trying to figure out what is the, you know, what is the paper thickness that is acceptable for children? Because you don't want them to tear it, but you don't want it to be too heavy. And then at some point we realized that, you know, kids have these really tiny bags, so it can't be an A4 size book. It needs to be small. And so I had this great idea. And like Ambi said, we had like, two teachers and three students. And and uh, then I went to the printer and I'm like, can you print these books for me? And he's like, sure, but you need to print 500. And I was like, nobody wants to buy 500 of these books. So we went there <laughs> and we decided to have uh, 500 and fill our pa- parents' basement anyways. And from there, 
we learned that kids were responding to this book. And the second thing that we learned from there was that kids who didn't come from musical families were, as everyone predicted, disadvantaged. Mm -hmm. Which is such a horrible thing because for Ambi and I, the point has always been that exposure trumps blood. Right. Right. On the on the nature versus nurture side, you can make arguments about talent and this and that. But I refuse to believe that you are born with music in your blood. It's an issue of exposure. So we were finding that in some cases, kids who weren't from families where the parents had learned music were having trouble matching pitch. And then we decided to, and then everybody's like, see, not in the blood, right? <laughs> so then we're like, that, that can't be it. And then we realized that kids weren't using the electronic tamburas. They weren't using the tanpuras because the parents didn't know why they were important. And because right. classical music is so high class, and if you don't mm -hmm. understand it and you, you ask questions, you're automatically stupid. They didn't think to ask why they should have the tanpuras. Mm -hmm. And then we realized that, okay, we need to make this more accessible. So we started putting in a note to parents in every book. So even if it's a really stupid question, even if it's, there's no such thing as a stupid question, no matter Absolutely. how basic it is, make all the information easily accessible. And then what we did is we took these tamburas and we put them inside stuffed animals. Right. And we started giving them to kids. Right. So we're like, this is your practice buddy switch him on and then this little red light would come on where where the stuffed animal's heart was and they started practicing and and that actually made a difference can i get one of those um yeah sure don't announce your address on this podcast because i feel like you're famous enough that people will follow you home but i will send you one oh, for sure that sounds like an amazing invention to be honest i've only just found out about it and I've always struggled with pitch. I don't come from a musical family. It's a Bengali family, but music is something. Is, right. <laughs> mm, I'm not going to comment for my parents' safety now these days. But yeah, that sounds amazing, right? Like pitch, for example, right? it's such a fundamental concept in, in music. And I mean, the usual musical tradition in Indian households is guests are here, beta gana ga ke suna. And nobody cares about pitch, right? They don't even care about tempo. They just care about performance, right? And at this point, to have an invention like this sounds sounds like a great starting point. Let me ask you this. What other devices, whether it's tech-backed or or the book or frameworks, have you found useful? I'll toss it to Ambi this time. So there are a couple of things. I think one is, of course, the tabura that we use. We also use a tala meter or a metronome, which is actually quite um, often ignored by a lot of a lot of teachers, a lot of students as well. A lot of the things that we use are very, very basic so that mm -hmm. everybody can use it. Everybody has access to it. So uh, we also kind of, uh, on our platform, we have like a tuner, a metronome and a tambura that mm -hmm. um, anybody can kind of come and use. A lot of the things that can be used don't have to be very complicated, mm -hmm. but uh, it's kind of that consistent use that makes all the difference. So there are like a, a thousand other apps out there that are um, that kind of help you with specifics, but uh, uh, it's often the the simple ones that uh, that uh, make all the difference. <laughs> so what I'm hearing is your focus on getting the basics in place has really been, I think, the foundation stone for you to build on. Right? I mean, and, and absolutely. You, yeah, you you said it upfront saying, hey. We don't care if you end up being a musician for life or not, but you need to be exposed and you need to have access and understanding and appreciation for this most wonderful of natural gifts that we have, which is, which is listening to and creating music and sharing music. That's wonderful. I'm going to take a quick break as we set course for this conversation. On the other side, we'll talk to Bindu and Ambi about the progress they've made with Sapa from 20, 2007 when it started, 2011 when these two joined formally, 2014 when Sapa became part of school curriculums to where they are now in 2021. Back on Storytellers and story sellers right after these messages. A hundred bucks. That's all it takes to begin your journey with Bitcoin and Ethereum. No, really. With CoinSwitch, you can start investing in over a hundred cryptocurrencies with just hundred rupees. On top of that, there are zero charges for deposits and withdrawals, so you can trade, buy, sell, however and whenever you want. 
All of this plus their extremely intuitive interface makes CoinSwitch the perfect app for beginners in the crypto space. But don't take my word for it. Just download CoinSwitch for free and try it out for yourself. If you'd like more information on cryptocurrencies, tune into a show about crypto with me, Rohan Joshi, my new adventure on IBM Podcasts. Coin switch, kuch to badlega. And we're back. This is Storytellers and Storytellers. You're listening to me talk to Bindu and Ambi about Sapa and how they're making music learning more accessible. Why don't you tell me about where you're at in your journey now, right? Like just before we went into the break, I said. 2011 was when you started. I think 2014 is when Sapa started being introduced in school curriculums. How how was that? And how did, how, how did you arrive at that decision? And what were, at that time, challenges you faced or resistance you faced when you were setting that up? Let, let's talk about 2014 and getting Sapa into schools this time. Bindu? So I think a lot of it stems from the fact that we are performers, right? And we've kind of been on stage since we were kids. And so this natural progression of wanting to make music a part of everyone's life sort of comes from the value we've seen in our own lives, right? So from being on stage to being around musicians to just kind of that global exposure of of like listening to an African song or listening to a Latin American song or listening to, you know, an Indian classical song and just kind of making all those connections. Mm-hmm. We realize that it's, it's as Ambi said earlier, not just about being a musician, right? It's about making music a meaningful part of everybody's life. And if you want to reach everybody and if you want to make it a meaningful part of everybody's life, then it needs to be a part of school curriculum. And obviously there have been directives globally for decades, if not, if not longer about how music should be a part and why music should be a part. And research has been done on the benefits of music education. And and there are so many, you know, whether you're looking at cognitive benefits or whether you're looking at social emotional benefits or social benefits, they, they, I mean, there there is plenty of research out there if you look for it. But somehow we found that in the Indian context, the proper ecosystem for music education has been missing. Mm-hmm. And the difference there, apart from, you know, you highlighting that you, you get one music period and you get nine maths periods. The other big difference there is that when you're hired as a music teacher, you're expected to bring in your own curriculum, your own pedagogy, your own learning materials. You're supposed to kind of have your own assessment framework. You're, whereas if you are a math teacher, you have studied how to teach math right? You uh, have textbooks, you have lesson plans, you have curriculum, you have continuing education, you have exams. So there's, it's, there's a structure around it, which sort of makes it more legitimate. And that structure was not in place for music. Right. And when you don't have that structure in place, even when you have people who value music, it's hard for them to take it seriously because every year you'll have a different person come into the classroom and teach you a few songs that they know. Mm -hmm. And there are problems on both sides, right? Teachers don't want to stay in that ecosystem because they're not valued. Right. Right. Principals don't know how to hire music teachers because they don't know what the framework is. And they're concerned that the turnover rate of music teachers is really high. Right. So really what was necessary was someone to come in and sort of create legitimacy for it, which is, really been what our fight is about. It's about creating legitimacy for music in the education ecosystem. And and I think now with like the new national education policy, which we were fortunate to consult on as well, it's this idea of breaking down curricular, co-curricular, extracurricular activities and saying, you know, all the subjects in some sense are equal. I know that that's a very utopian statement and nobody's going to kind of give equal weightage to say science and and music for the next, I don't know how many years, but Mm -hmm. at least we're thinking in the direction of let's see what other skills our children need, right? When you talk about what people used to call soft skills, those are our 21st century skills, right? Critical thinking, communication, teamwork, music helps you build those things, right? These are the things that the computers can't do. So I think we're slowly and and we're slowly moving towards that place where we are realizing that we need to do more beyond just math and science. 
Mm-hmm. You can also connect music to math and science, which is a great plug for us, by the way, right? When you talk about, you know, how Konakol is, is both math and music. And, and then we talk about physics and string quartets and how that's, you know, science and music. And, and that's all really fascinating or music and social emotional learning. Uh, and, and it's been a journey. And I think it's been going well because parents have seen changes. Students have seen changes. And it just kind of makes everyone more joyous. We've seen in government schools that we work, attendance actually spikes on days that they have music class. And that's a really powerful thing. Right. That's amazing. I mean, I was going to ask you for for a few more examples, but that really puts it into into stark contrast, right? Mm -hmm. Because government schools and the state of government schools, and that's another podcast episode on another podcast probably, to have that kind of impact, which I think you really see in the kind of impact that you'd really see with stuff like a midday meals program, right? You'd see attendance spike in schools which have better, which have a full-fledged midday meals program. To have music have that kind of effect, really feeding the soul there, isn't it? Let me ask you this, and you spoke about it briefly. How was the experience on advising on on the national education policy? And I'm going to ask you this in light of knowing that the current government, uh, at least at the central level, has always had emphasis on extracurricular efforts, right? And I've been fortunate enough to work with the government of Gujarat for for a year or so where sports was the apple of the government's eye and um, massive efforts on sports. Are Are you seeing that kind of emphasis on music? What was that engagement like for you, Ambi? Uh, Actually, maybe Bindu, better if you take this, because we're talking about the NEP and um, yeah, he was a bit more involved there. Maybe Bindu can start off and Ambi will... Let it never be said that I did not allow him to speak. So, with... I, I, I feel like some... There's like sort of sibling tension here, which which I'm getting in the crossfire, this whole thing. Sibling affection, yes. <laughs> <laughs> but hey, uh, I will go out on record and, and say this. Bindu invited Ambi to speak not just once, multiple times on the show. Let it never be said, right? But the NEP. And I will go on record to say my very favorite podcaster is Vineet. Thank you so much. <laughs> so with, with the NEP, I think what was really cool about this one, and, and I, I do agree that there have been national education policies before. There have been kind of these very emphasis is that this this kind of uh, advisory council or, or the drafting team was sort of all-star, right? We had Kasuri Rangan, who was like an ISRO chairman, and, and he brought this kind of gravitas and this sort of respect. And then we had Manjul Bhargava, who was India's first field medalist. And then they, and, and they all respected art. So in fact, I think it was Manjul Bhargava who said, you know, a lot of my creativity in mathematics comes from the fact that I play the tabla. Mm-hmm. And how do we give that to people who are being educated? And so moving from a point of view where you're so open-minded about how education should work was, I think, a great starting point for this document. And then it kind of got the attention of many people. What I thought was really cool is that they released the draft policy for the common folk like us to go through and give comments. And and I think everyone just sort of felt much more a part of it. And at the end of the day, it is it is just a policy. It's not law. So it, it has to trickle down into different boards like the CBSC and the ICSC. Mm-hmm. But I feel like, or maybe it's because I'm a parent now, but I feel like parents and people who aren't just educationists are aware of the policy. People are talking about the policy. People are saying, oh yes, we should do all these things. Oh yes, different languages are important. Oh yes, creativity is important. And so I think it has to start at the policy level. And then the implementation depends on all the stakeholders coming together and agreeing that yes, music is important. Culture is important. Art is important. Language is important. Love it. Um, Yeah, and one one thing I think that is very encouraging nowadays. Also, I think when we kind of started SAPA in SAPA in schools uh, in 2014, there were a lot of schools that honestly needed convincing for the need for mm-hmm. music. Mm-hmm. So a lot of them are like, you know, okay, fine. We we have, we teach everything else. Let's see. I mean, I don't think we can add one more thing for the children. And then, uh, so it was a very kind of different mindset. 
maybe say in the last three, four, five years, when we kind of speak to schools or or other educators, now that's not there anymore. So right. you know, we don't have to convince anybody that music is important anymore. So to that kind of um, that kind of makes it very encouraging. And there is obviously a lot more push from parents as well. Mm-hmm. That mm-hmm. It's not just that uh, my child has to kind of uh, uh, be prepared for IIT, but my child has to be well-rounded and my child has to kind of be a, kind of a good citizen and my child should know all these different things. So I think when there's a push from parents, that also makes a massive, massive uh, difference. Love it. Uh, absolutely love it. I think as more educated parents see, you know, success stories around the world of young prodigies achieving so much and well-rounded kids turning out to be well-rounded citizens, I'm, I'm sure we're just at the top of the hill rolling down into, into the snowballing avalanche of, of better education in music. Let me ask you this though, again, coming from personal experience about this, right? I know for a fact that my cousins learned classical music, right? All the best singers I know are classically trained, right? We have a myriad of traditions of classical music, but contemporary music is what the young consume and seem to be more predisposed towards. So over the past 10 years or so that you've been running this, what sort of shifts have you seen, if any, in the genres that young students choose to learn? And and how do you deal with that? So I think one one thing that we have always kind of been focused on is teaching music from around the world. So it's not just classical music that we teach or contemporary music, but we try to kind of give kids a kind of nice overview of different styles of music. Because end of the day, uh, I mean, we strongly believe that there is no one good style or one bad style of music, but it's what music you respond to. Uh, so for that, it's important to make sure that that kids have access to quality music in terms of, so if, if they're learning different styles of music, it's important that they are kind of exposed to the best of each of those genres. And in general, one advantage of learning any style of classical music is that since it's been around for so many years, the structure is very solid. Mm-hmm. So if somebody wants to kind of learn whether it's Western classical or Indian classical or, or any of these styles, there is a systematic way of, of kind of learning your scales of, of voice production or if you're playing an instrument, how your, vo- your violin technique or your guitar technique, all of that is kind of uh, been developed and uh, a kind of refined over years. To that uh, kind of degree, it kind of helps to learn some style of of um, of classical music, whatever style uh, you're kind of interested in. And uh, we've been really making sure that they're exposed to different styles of music. Mm-hmm. So at the end of the day, if if one child wants to sing, uh, sing Spanish flamenco music and one child wants to sing uh, an African lullaby and one child wants to sing Carnatic music, great. And I think I mean, that's kind of how we've been in our own careers. Like when people ask us what genre of music we perform, that's that's like the the one <laughs> question that sort of stumps us. Otherwise, we keep talking because we uh, are sort of just chasing whatever genre is interesting to us at that point in time. And it's mm-hmm. about taking different musical elements and bringing them together in a way that seems meaningful to you at that point. So we've many times taken sort of classical music, raga tala concepts and put it put them in you know western pop song structures or we brought in like flamenco rhythm and then put alaps on top of it because i i don't think that you need to be very restricted there is a purity around classical music and the preservation of tradition and all of that is really important but we don't believe that you should be close to anything so if people are open about contemporary music and classical music and seeing the intersections of it and if you want classical music to stay alive and you want it to grow you have to be open-minded about it right Uh, and I think that's the cool thing right because we're actually for us we feel this immense sense of achievement when we see thousands of kids who are first generation classical musicians 
right? So we don't, where we're sitting, we don't see that number getting smaller. Yes, when they get into teenage, they're all sort of chasing Olivia Rodrigo and, and what Taylor Swift is doing. And I think all of that is great. But they're still respectful of and immersed in tradition. And they see a value in both. And I think right. that identity is is very cool. Being able to respect in our generation it, back in the day, it was Eminem and Emma Subalakshmi can kind of coexist. Right. I think that if, we, if we're able to do that on a large scale, then we've sort of done our job. Love it. What I'm hearing is classical music provides the framework for you to build your foundation and then take it wherever you like with your influences, your expression or, or whatever else have you, right? I love the way in which both of you said, hey, this is what we think and this is how we do it and it's easy. But I know that there is one part which is not easy, right? And I'm not even talking about my singing, right? I, I will we'll leave that conversation out. But it's, it's finding teachers who are able to live this pedagogy, express their musical talent in a way that is easily understood, that is approachable, accessible, understood. How do you do that? How do you find a teacher? And, and I've had some wonderful teachers who have been bad musicians and I've had some wonderful musician friends who've been bad teachers, right? And that intersection is hard to find. And I mean, no disrespect, but it's a fact of life, right? And this is true for teaching as a profession, as a, as a teacher myself. I know that a teacher can't have an ego about being a great musician. A teacher has to have empathy for 40 different students in your class, 40 different ways of learning right? Teacher needs to have patience. They need to have the will to learn for themselves. How do you bring together teaching talent like this, right? How do you, how do you train them? What do you keep in mind when you're training them? I'll, I'll throw it over to Ambi again. Yeah, well, I mean, that's a beautiful question. I think for us, uh, like you're saying, I, the first part is to kind of make sure that uh, performance and teaching are viewed as two different things two separate yeah. skills. It's great when you can sing or play your instrument proficiently, but teaching is a separate skill that needs to be taught and needs to be learned. So I think for us, a big part of that was uh, the fact that a lot of times, unfortunately, teaching is viewed as less than performance, mm -hmm. which we strongly disagree with. Because I think each, each of it has its own place. And I think it's, it's really beautiful when you have passionate educators kind of go into classrooms or go into rooms where they're teaching music because then kind of the impact that you see is just something else. So uh, for us, on the one side, our focus has been, of course, on making sure that we're able to reach as many kids as possible. But big part of what we do also is to kind of make livelihoods for uh, young and amazing musicians and music educators. So we have uh, a lot of our teachers are kind of doing concerts in the evening. They're doing playback. They're doing a lot of other things. We have some RJs. We have a, a lot of teachers who are doing a lot of cool things as well. And then what you see is they are so, so passionate when they go into classrooms. And a lot of our teachers have kind of left engineering jobs, left IT jobs, and left a lot of other things for this kind of passion towards music. And then when when you get uh, educators like that interacting with teachers, uh, interacting with students, the kind of impact is just something else. So we've, we've been tremendously lucky to kind of have these uh, amazing music educators who are all kind of going in each day to, to create that spark in, in, uh, in kids. So, and I think we've really benefited from having so many amazing educators with a lot of different points of view. So, yes, we have our teacher training and yes, we have a kind of uh, ways in which we kind of have our structure and we have our curriculum and all that. But it's, it's amazing when you have 50, 100 educators in the same room kind of saying, you know what? Uh, this is the activity, but then I tried doing this and then my kids love this. Mm -hmm. Or um, I was doing this activity and then I realized that this doesn't really work in my particular setting. So if anybody else kind of found this, maybe you can try this. And then so that um, we've really, really been lucky to have that community where 
uh, everybody's kind of happy to learn from each other. Everybody's kind of happy to uh, be in the same space and uh, help each other. So uh, we've tremendously benefited from that. And, uh, and of course, the students have benefited from that tremendously as well. And I think it's really important to acknowledge that these are not skills that you're born with, right? Right. And and somehow there's this assumption that, you know, to be a good musician, you have to work hard and you have to practice. And, and everyone acknowledges that, that that is a learned skill. But teaching, either you're born with it or you, it's never going to come. And that's that's where I think our community has helped us because people have been very open about the fact that teaching is also a learned skill. Like you're an educator yourself. You know that every day you go into the classroom, you're learning something new. And that's, that is an art that you have to polish and hone apart Absolutely. from your subject skills. So you're building two different skill sets and and you have to keep working towards both of them. Absolutely. I mean, if at any point during this conversation, I can claim to have an advantage, it is that I come from a family of educators. And that's something that's been handed down from my mother and her sisters. Um, I think, Ambi, it was you who said it, that teaching is something that also needs to be taught. And I'm, I'm so glad that um, that you're giving it the due uh, time of day. I think you have a partnership with the Norwegian School of Music as well where your educators are trained. So I'm seeing an emphasis on making sure you have the right quality of people and then they're exposed to the right quality of training to be able to, to impart what they have learned and the passions that they, that they carry with themselves for music to these kids. My last sort of formal question before we go into a quick short segment called Water with Vineet is this. What I've loved while I was reading up on Sapa was how you've evolved with with time, right? And how technology seems to be at the core of, of the SAPA experience or the pedagogy, right? I think you're planning, you've already put out all your material online for people to access. I think there's an app upcoming. Can you tell us about future plans and tell us about how people can sign up? Ambe, over to you. From the time we started, our, our main goal has kind of been to uh, see how we can reach as many students we can, how we can kind of uh, share our music with as many people as we can. Mm -hmm. So right now, in the last couple of years, obviously with, uh, it, it, I hate to say a couple of years, but it's been a couple of years since the pandemic. Right. Uh, so, what so is time have... anymore? It's just <laughs> one day after the other, isn't it? Totally. So there, overnight, we kind of had to uh, shut and we weren't able to see, kind of interact with our kids in, a, in an offline scenario and we we were very very um, kind of heavy on that side so so we had to kind of see how we could use technology and use these online methods to make sure that it's not just like a poor plan b but we're able to kind of utilize a lot of these things we really work to kind of make a lot of asynchronous courses with some of the best artists from around the world we've had uh, of course our, our parents uh, Kavita Krishnamurti Subramaniam, Dr. Subramaniam, who have kind of made uh, courses. We've also had people like uh, Pankaj Das Ji, Usha Utup Ji, some uh, amazing uh, um, musicians from around the world as well to kind of uh, make these courses. And uh, so we we made a lot of these kind of uh, masterclass type courses where mm -hmm. uh, people can come in and learn at their own pace. And uh, apart from that, we have been using a lot of kind of gamified content, uh, a lot of widgets so where uh, children can kind of have that wonderful, fun experience and learn music. Yeah, so we, we've been uh, working a lot on that side. And, um, but I think our kind of goal is the same. Uh, we've also had master classes with uh, these live master classes with a lot of great artists. Uh, but the end goal is kind of uh, to make sure that we're able to reach as many children as we can. I know we end up saying children a lot, uh, but I think in the last year and a half, we've had uh, quite a lot of um, adults learn music as well. We 30,000 kind of people is what I've read, is, is what you've got on. Yeah, on yeah. And uh, so we, we, we've seen actually post-COVID this huge spike in, in adults uh, learning music as well. And we, we kind of call them wellness seekers. It's been really nice to kind of see how that's changed and how how people want to interact with music. And I think a lot of, a, a lot of people have kind of uh, also kind of joined music class and trying to bring music a part of their lives. The purpose 
in in some cases has been a little different from pre pre covid times so mm-hmm. for us it's also interesting to kind of see that and understand that and try to understand how people want to interact with music now and uh, so we're kind of using tech we're trying to use uh, other skills as well but end of the day it's it's how do we kind of uh, make sure that uh, uh, music has an impact in as many people's lives as possible love it and how do people access it how do you sign up how do you how do you access it yeah so they can go to sapaindia.com s a p a india.com and they'll find all, all details um, regarding this <laughs> wonderful and is there like a entry price point or something like that i mean this is your your moment to to make a pitch okay if we are making a pitch then i am going to ask bindu to talk <laughs> there sure bindu it's right back to you now that is so bad what i what i am going to say is please follow us on social media on instagram and follow us on social media facebook and instagram and wherever else the cool kids are social mediaing these days at sapa india is the official handle and then i'm at bindu sub that's b i n d u s u b and at ambi sub a m b i s u b and if you go to our website what i think is great is that we have a bunch of different offerings for different age groups different aspirations whether you want to be a professional musician or you just want to play the guitar on the weekend evening or you just want to learn you know what the inside of anup jalota ji's mind looks like when he sings bhajans we've got things for you so please do come and check it out and we'd love to hear you know what what is exciting to you what more content you want us to create because for us the the most fun is is just creating content love it all very compelling reasons to go check out sapa at sapa india and all those handles that uh, bindu mentioned to round this episode off we will do a quick round of what of with vinith what of with vinith is my segment where i ask you snap questions and you give me snap answers it is not inspired by any other talk show that is a statutory disclaimer i will put every time i do the segment my first question to the two of you is tell me one thing you hated about learning music growing up getting bitten by mosquitoes really Yeah. But that's like you would you prefer it if you got bit by mosquitoes and you didn't learn music? I mean that's something everyone hates. I, I don't I mean I don't No but see see this is the point like it was just it was so in my mind so closely uh, like m- music lessons were mosquito bite time because we had to sit quietly and we Oh couldn't. right. That sounds traumatizing. Yeah, it was it was very traumatic. Right. Ambi uh, I think it was having to practice regularly. So I, I would hate that. So <laughs> So I, I would kind of like practice in spurts, and then I uh, there would be we- weeks where you know I, I would do a lot, and then weeks where I would do nothing, and then uh, my teachers would be very very confused, saying like last week you did so much, this week like you, you don't know what's happening. So yeah, I, I hated uh, having to do consistent work. Love it. I I hate it too, but I'm not going to tell anyone. My next question is: How do you answer parents? who are naysayers so like music karke kya karega lawyer ban engineer ban doctor ban or whatever else how do you how do you answer them <laughs> <laughs> we'll go with I'm looking for the, yeah. yeah so i i would say two things i would say give it time and uh, see see what happens and see the kind of benefits it has and the second thing was is not everything has to be for something right absolutely i mean the simplicity of that second thing is lost on on all of us who are in this sort of productivity race a little bit aren't we great answer man bindu wait i thought only one of us had to answer i i want to take his answer okay we will take his answer <laughs> for for yours my last question is in this time i want answers from both of you give me some of your favorite musicians oh i like so many musicians i like ella fitzgerald ms subalakshmi Eminem has always been a favorite. I'm listening a lot to Taylor Swift now. My parents are among my favorite musicians. Yeah, I I will listen to anything really. I like Linkin Park. I'll be over to you. Yeah, I I'm very confused with this answer as well. And it's confusing even though I I get answer I get asked this pretty much all the time. I still don't have an answer to this. But uh yeah, I think it depends on on my mood. I try to listen to a lot of different things. Uh, I think Spotify really helps for that. 
uh, like you one day you just go and try to listen to different people's playlists. So of course, on the classical side, there are a lot of musicians that I I love listening to. Uh, I love listening to um, kind of uh, symphonic works. I love listening to uh, just like a solo piano as well. Uh, so yeah, um, I I know I didn't give you specifics, but uh, that's part oh, of my life. That 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 was great. I think uh, that that was wonderful. And since you like solo piano works, I will recommend Through Pens to you. It was my one of my top listened to artists last year. Like a solo jazz pianist does doing his own sort of ambient work. Fantastic to check out. And with that, we are at the end of this episode. Um, I had a great time learning about Sapa from you guys. Um, I love the passion with which you talk about this project that that you're dedicating so much time and effort to. I hope you had fun discussing it with me. Uh, it was absolutely wonderful having the two of you on. Yeah, the show. it was good fun. This was a lot of fun. Yeah. Love it. Just to round this off, if you're a parent or if you're like me, can't play an instrument to save your life, please go to Sapa, learn some music, do yourself a favor. It's it's beautiful. It's it's wonderful. It's absolutely amazing. I'm very fortunate that my day job involves music to a large degree. So I'm going to do this on my own time, but you should do it now. That's it <laughs> on this episode of Storytellers and Story Sellers. This is me, Vinit Kanabar, saying goodbye. Hey, everybody, it's been another great week on the IVM Podcast Network. On Advertising is Dead, Varun Dugirala talks to Divyanshu Damani, co-founder and CEO at Tag Mango. The two discuss how content creators can monetize their content going beyond the traditional ads and brand deals. On The Habit Coach, Ashton is in conversation with Ashna Modi, clinical psychologist at ASA Wellness. They discuss the habit of deservability and gratitude. On Probation's The Promotion Thug, host Abhinav talks about business networking and teaches us how to enhance those networking skills. On The Longest Constitution, Priya gives us a peek into the history of caste-based discrimination and how our constitution is committed to overcoming that. And on The Musafir Stories, the hosts are joined by author and poet Mihir Vatsa. They discover the plateau town of Hazaribagh. Do follow us on social media. We're IVM Podcast on Twitter, Facebook, Instagram, and LinkedIn. And also do check out our YouTube channels. We have a number of them. You can get them on ivmpodcast.com slash YouTube. And remember, if you're enjoying this show, or any of our other shows for that matter, please do tell a friend. It really does help us spread the word. And finally, we'd like to thank our sponsors for the network this week, Cred, Bank of Baroda, CoinSwitch, Kuber, Intel, and Oxfam India. Thank you so much for making this possible. Come learn and experience the ABCDs of being queer with me, Shunetro. And me, Farhad. On our show, Gay BCD. The two of us take you through our stories and experiences of being gay men in the city of Mumbai and have candid and sometimes downright scandalous conversations about sexuality, gay culture, and everything in between. Catch new episodes of Gay BCD every Tuesday on the IBM Podcast website, app, or wherever you get all your podcasts from.